working in my favor. Um, and I'm planning to talk about first um, details of um, the rest of the organs of the innate immune system or the immune system in general that I didn't tell you about uh, last time, and then get into some specific details of um, part of the innate immune system. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, if you recall um, previously on episodes of immunology class, um, we were talking about organs of the immune system, and I had introduced first the primary lymphoid organs, and then um, we started with the secondary lymphoid organs. And so we're kind of at this idea of secondary lymphoid organs right now. Um, the primary lymphoid organs we saw last time were the bone marrow and the thymus, the ones that are in red here. And that is where immune cells develop. While the secondary lymphoid organs are shown here in yellow, um, and they are places where um, immune cells meet uh, their microbe meet their pathogen and start to make a response. Um, and in particular, that's important for lymphocytes. Um, like I mentioned, uh, a lot of times I think about secondary lymphoid organs as where the party happens. Um, and in really explaining those secondary lymphoid organs, I had to tell you a little bit about the immunologist's view of the circulatory system. Um, your textbook, even in this figure where it's not totally going into this detail, um, even hints at this because it does show the heart. <laughs> um, because thinking about the circulatory system in relation to secondary lymphoid organs is kind of key. Um, and so I told you a bit about some of these problems that we have with the uh, circulatory system. And we talked about the idea of this big pump, the heart, pushing liquid through um, first the aorta, this kind of big tube, <laughs> and then the fact that the tubes get progressively smaller and smaller. And we discussed the fact that this um, has the potential to actually cause a problem if you really think about all the details of it, because as you decrease the diameter of the vessel, you actually get a big change in pressure. Um, and you can imagine that with a garden hose in, the, the, um, in your backyard. Um, and so if it would just work like this, then we would all explode. Um, and we noted we did not explode. Um, and I told you that the reason that we don't explode, the thing that actually deals with this um, pressure, potential pressure imbalance, is that um, all of the arteries have selectively permeable walls so that the liquid can get forced out. So as um, the blood moves through the circulatory system, the liquid's getting forced out to equalize the pressure. So, you know, by the time the blood's getting to the capillaries, it's really just the cells. All the liquid has been forced out. That's kind of good because it also means that, like, all of your tissues are basically bathing in this nice nutrient-rich liquid coming from the heart. It's a pretty easy way to move nutrients around. Um, in kind of anatomy and physiology terms, we often talk about this bathing liquid as the interstitial fluid. Um, but I left you off on a cliffhanger of this problem related to this interstitial fluid. And I said, okay, so your arteries are basically leaking fluid into your tissues all the time to deal with this pressure problem. And what if, if that was just all the whole story, you would basically turn into a great big blob because you just have liquid continuously leaking into your tissues and you'd become a blob of liquid. <laughs> so something has to happen to that liquid so you don't become a big blob. Um, and the answer to what happens with that liquid is that we have a separate set of vessels. We have a separate system that's going to collect the liquid. And the big picture idea is that liquid is getting collected and is going to get thrown back into the blood. So it basically gets collected after it's been all over the body and it gets put back in the blood. So it's sort of recycled back in. You don't end up as a blob. Um, 
And so here you can see in the red, we've got sort of uh, an artery. In the blue, we've got a vein. So you can see kind of that normal circulatory system. But there's actually this other additional system of vessels that's collecting the liquid. And those vessels are the lymphatic vessels or the lymph vessels. Um, and I often think about that fluid, um, that random fluid, because it's going to end up in the lymph vessel as being called the lymph fluid. Um, and so you have the, basically this second circulatory system of lymphatic vessels. And the job of these lymphatic vessels is collecting the liquid. Um, and this is another view of the lymphatic vessels um, that kind of helps us understand what's up. This is a view from your textbook that I'll mention a little bit more that's on the right. Um, these lymphatic vessels are basically open-ended vessels throughout your body. There's no pump on them. So there's nothing that's like officially pushing the liquid back into it. But the vessels all have one-way valves. So if liquid gets in, it can only flow forward. It can't go backwards. So basically, you have these like open pipes that hopefully the liquid gets pushed into. And once it gets pushed in, it can only keep going forward. It can't spill back out because of these valves. The way that you push liquid into all of these open valves that you have throughout the body or these open pipes, open tubes, is by body movements. And so as you're moving your body, that's moving that liquid around and the liquid ends up flowing over one of these and just flowing into it. And so we have this whole system, all these little bitty open vessels that you can see branch back together and branch back together to make bigger and bigger branches. Um, so this is good for that job of the hut problem. But evolution also was pretty clever with this situation. Because if you think about it, if you have liquid from your whole body that you're collecting up, that's a really good way to do some surveillance of what's in your body at different locations. That's a pretty good way to find if there are microbes or random things in the body, because they're going to get swept up into this system too, into these open tubes. Um, and so every so often on the network of lymphatic vessels, there is a specialized structure for immune surveillance to actually look and see, is there a pathogen in this little region? <laughs> um, and that's the lymph node. And so really that's what the lymph node is, is it's sort of a specialized surveillance structure at some point in the lymphatic system. And you can see this from your textbook here, and then I'll get to your question. Um, so here is... We've got sort of just random skin. We've got blood vessel. Under the skin, we have these open vessels. You can see that there are some immune cells that actually use this as a highway to move. That's a later problem for us. But um, you can, so there are immune cells that are moving. You can see just random microbes are getting picked up. Um, you can't really see the liquid very well, but it's the liquid's all getting picked up in here um, just randomly as we're moving around the body. Um, and eventually, it's all going to get pushed through um, some of these lymph nodes where our lymphocytes or other cells can actually check out um, the things that are coming through that location um, and try to potentially start a response. So Shelby, what was your question? Um, not necessarily, but it is what happens if a person, it, like if somebody's really sedentary, like in the hospital for a long period of time, they usually actually have to move them. And it's because they'll actually have their lymph start pooling um, in some locations if they're not, you're not moving around very much. Um, so you can kind of see um, this process as well. These are the, the ways that your textbooks show this. So you've got everything coming out of the heart. Arteries can go to the lymph node or lymphatics can go to the lymph node. Um, you can see that you know, the, some stuff goes back to the heart through the veins, but the lymphatics also bring stuff back to the heart and mix it all back together. <laughs> so we end up with all the liquid and all the cells back by the time we have the heart. And you can see that happening here, too. So here's blood uh, arteries and veins moving stuff back and forth to the heart. And we also have this lymphatic system that's just going to dump everything back in. <laughs> um, 
So anything that you had that kind of got lost in the process gets brought back to the heart through the lymphatic system. Um, and those you can see this is actually a somewhat good picture of this process of the lymphatics and lymph nodes throughout the whole body. Um, and so you can see that you have lymphatics and lymph nodes everywhere. Um, one, I said that it's sort of up to date. Um, one thing that we actually have figured that has actually been learned in the since I've been teaching at Drew is actually how much more this extends up into um, a lot of areas of the brain. And so, in fact, this sort of shows it's stopping up here, but it does actually um, continue uh, a lot further. Um, if any of you guys take cell and molecular neuro with Professor um, Knowles, you will do some dissections of brains. And one of the things he always does is he picks off this layer called the meninges. The meninges is basically the, the lymphatics um, <laughs> that are surrounding that. But you can see you've got all these lymph, little lymph nodes, like little sort of dot areas throughout your body. Um, and the, the basic way, sort of idea, or the way you can think about this is that each lymph node is sort of responsible for a section of your body. Um, so all of the liquid from that section of your body goes through that lymph node. It's usually known as what is the draining lymph node for that location. So for example, um, uh, tomorrow I'm going to get my updated flu shot. Um, I'll get it in this arm. And that will eventually cause some drainage to the lymph node that deals with this arm. So I expect on Sunday I'm going to be able to feel the lymph node under my armpit um, because that's the lymph node that actually drains the upper part of your arm. Um, the lower part of your leg drains into a lymph node that's behind your knee. The upper part of your leg drains into a lymph node that's in your groin. Um, your sort of this part of your your head, particularly your sinuses, drains into these lymph nodes here. Um, and so there's sort of some draining lymph node that um, is going to sort of be responsible for each part of your body. You can also imagine that that's a lot more efficient for the immune system because now if, say, you are a very specific lymphocyte and you go to a particular lymph node and you're like, oh, my gosh, my microbe is here, you know which region of the body the microbe is in. It must be in the region of the body that was drained from that lymph node. And so you don't have to search every cell of the body. Like, is this one infected? Is this one infected? Is this one infected? Is this one infected? You only have to search that region that was drained by that lymph node. And so it starts to kind of make this much more efficient. So if the lymph, so basically the lymphocytes just travel between all of these lymph nodes to check out each location of the body. Um, and the lymph nodes are kind of the big, most famous example of the secondary lymphoid organs. So again, where the party happens, the place where those lymphocytes are meeting those microbes. And that's because the lymph, these lymph nodes, as all secondary lymphoid organs, have arteries and veins coming in, um, but they also have lymphatic vessels coming in and out. So we bring in the lymph, we bring in you know, microbes, we can bring in immune cells. Everybody can meet here. Everybody can be, you know, get organized here. Um, and then go out and make whatever responses, but it's kind of localized to a particular part of the body. What you can also notice is the lymph node does have sort of specific substructures within in it. It's not just, you know, all equal. You can see there's different parts and you can even see some of those different parts under a microscope with histology. Um, so we will talk more about some of those individual parts when we are talking about adaptive immune responses. Um, but just note that's our lymph node. Um, the lymph nodes are the kind of most famous um, secondary lymphoid organs, but they're not the only secondary lymphoid organs. Um, there are some others, um, but if you get the lymph nodes, you pretty much get the others. Um, so the other really famous one is the spleen. Um, in my mind, the spleen is basically a giant lymph node <laughs> um, with kind of two unique features. One is that it has all of the same kind of areas that the lymph node does, but it also has some other areas called red pulp because the spleen has a second job of red blood cell um, 
maintenance and red blood cell turnover. So the spleen is like lymph noding and red blood celling. So it has two separate parts. Um, spoiler alert for next week's lab with the mouse. You will see quite quickly that the spleen is red and the lymph nodes are white. <laughs> Um, and that's because the spleen has this extra blood function that the lymph nodes don't have. Um, and when I think about lymph nodes at different parts of the body, I can tell you that they're sort of draining different regions of the body. The spleen, in a lot of ways, is the, the, the lymph node or the secondary lymphoid organ that drains the blood. So it's the one that's kind of checking the blood in general instead of uh, different organs. Um, because it's really easy to work with, it's the one that immunologists tend to often use because it's it's just, again, as you'll see with the mouse, it's super easy to do stuff with. Um, there are other secondary lymphoid organs as well. Um, and um, they most of the other ones have this ALT at the end of their name. Um, the ALT stands for associated lymphoid tissue. And so the idea is that basically these are sort of areas in different anatomic locations that have sort of specialized almost like into mini lymph nodes. Um, and so GALT, um, you have quite a bit of. GALT is officially the gastrointestinal <laughs> associated lymphoid tissue. So it's some places in your GI tract that have almost become like mini lymph nodes because there's a lot of microbes that come into your GI tract. You, you need to be able to do a lot of surveillance there. And so here you can see that in this part of, you know, we've got gut wall doing all of its digestion absorption stuff, but every so often we'll have like a little organized spot of uh, lymphatic tissue that looks like a mini lymph node that helps do surveillance right there. Um, and so it, it has a very specialized structure. Um, this is actually a mouse small intestine. And you can see these little white dots on the side. Those are gastrointestinal lymphoid tissue spots, like mini lymph nodes. Um, they're called Peyer's patches. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to show you a Peyer's patch um, on, uh, in lab next week as well. Um, so you've got a lot of these sort of weird specialized tissues. Um, in my experience, these are pretty hard to work with. And so um, at least in a lot of my stuff, a lot of the stuff in your textbook, we're going to be kind of like hand wavy stuff because we don't often like grind up people's intestines to look at the cells that live there. We more likely take some blood. Um, so like I there, I think the the estimate of how many cells um, are in your GALT right now in terms of your lymphocytes is I believe between 10 and 90%. So, you know, really, really precise. Um, you've got similar types of tissue in um, other anatomic locations as well. Um, in general, we kind of group all of this as the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or MALT. Um, sometimes if we want to get really excited, we might talk about just the stuff that's in the bronchial area. So the bronchial associated lymphoid tissue or BALT. Some people um, even get really excited to think about the nasal lymphoid tissue and just the lymphoid tissues in your nose. That will be the NALT. So we can come up with all sorts of wacky acronyms here. But so we've got things like some specialized tissue in the nose, some specialized tissue in the lung, some specialized tissue um, in other mucosal sites. We also got things like the adenoids and the tonsils, all as sort of mini lymph nodes um, to help in locations that have a lot of exposure to microorganisms. Um, and uh, just as sort of a, a reminder, this is that paper that I mentioned to you on Wednesday. Each box is um, a billion cells. So again, note how much, how many cells you saw from a basically drop of blood yesterday. Um, so each of those boxes is a million cells. Um, specifically, this is looking at immune cells. Um, and what I wanted to point out was this area is the number of our leukocytes 
that are in the lymphatic system. Um, and so it is, if I was going to have to pick an organ, it'd be one of the big <laughs> places where we find a lot of these cells. Um, but that's only the primary lymphoid organs and the secondary lymphoid organs. As I told you last time, there's a third set of organs as well, um, which are very creatively named the tertiary lymphoid organs. Um, and the tertiary lymphoid organs are kind of fun to um, describe because the tertiary lymphoid organs. Well, actually, I'm going to give you the definition and then I'm going to ask you to give me some example to give me an example. OK. The tertiary lymphoid organ is um, anywhere where an immune response is happening, where you are responding to a pathogen. So what is an example of a tertiary lymphoid organ? Yeah. Every organ of the body. <laughs> um, it's just the, it's sort of in a specific situation. So if you had a zit and you're making a little bit of an inflammatory response, at that moment, that part of your skin is a tertiary lymphoid organ because you're making a response right then in that part of your skin. If you have a liver infection, at that moment, your liver is a tertiary lymphoid organ. Wait, basically, whatever place you're making a response tomorrow when I get vaccinated, my arm muscle is going to be a tertiary lymphoid organ. Um, so it's kind of wherever the, the individual location um, of that response is. So it can basically be anywhere. Um, so they're kind of easy to understand. Um, so that's the, all the stuff I was going to tell you about Wednesday. Um, and now that we kind of have our who's who, um, we can actually start thinking about some details of um, different immune responses. And um, when we talk about innate immune responses, as we are doing right now, um, we often will do some distinctions into what's known as the humoral innate immune response, um, which is what is on the syllabus for today, versus the cellular innate immune response. The, another way of saying that is proteins versus cells doing something. So is it just a protein doing something, or is it a cell? And in the case of the innate immune system, thinking about some proteins versus thinking about some cells is a really useful distinction. So today I'm going to largely be talking about the protein parts of the innate immune response. And then next week we'll talk about the cell part. And this figure um, from your textbook kind of gets at these issues in um, why I'm distinguishing between the proteins and the cells. The big distinction with the innate immune proteins is that they are pre-made proteins. You have them right now. They don't need anything to get them started. So if you get infected with a microbe, those proteins could start working one minute later. Basically, they are the thing that is protecting you absolutely immediately. There's no startup time needed at all. And so you can see your textbook says, you know, look at the immediate response between zero to four hours. Um, and so that's really these proteins that are just already there, already ready to go. No startup required. The innate immune cells take a little while to get going. And so you can see this lists them as starting between about four hours and throughout the first four days. So the biggest difference here is that the proteins are the things that are going to be acting first, and they're kind of like what you got for that first four hours until you get the innate immune cells. Um, and so that's sort of why this is such a useful distinction. Sometimes those innate immune proteins are enough, and then you get rid of the pathogen and you live happily ever after, and you don't even need to wait for the cells. And there's like a whole other part to this figure of the adaptive immune system later, but we're not there yet. Sometimes you actually need the cells to come in and do something too. Um, I mentioned before 
kind of some of the different features of pathogens that we might think about. And the innate immune proteins that we're talking about right now are particularly good if a pathogen is extracellular. So these proteins are going to be really good at dealing with microbes that are outside of our cells. Most of the proteins that we're going to talk about here aren't so useful if the pathogen was already inside one of our cells. Um, but given that we're talking about like zero to four hours, it probably hasn't made it into one of our cells yet. So that's OK. So that's sort of these are kind of the specialties of these particular parts of the innate immune response. Um, so there are kind of two parts to humoral innate immunity or these innate immune proteins as I think about them. One is this group of proteins that are just generally known as antimicrobial peptides. And so there are these proteins that basically work against different microbes. If you recall, when I told you about the three layers of the immune system, I said that sometimes it can get a little sketchy between some of the layers. And this is a, one thing where you could say that because these antimicrobial peptides are one of the features of barrier organs, is that barrier organs make tons of antimicrobial peptides. And so are they part of the barrier level or are they part of the innate immune level? You could philosophically discuss that at some point. But what you can see is that any of our um, barrier organs like the skin, the gut, the lungs, or the eyes will all have antimicrobial peptides being made um, to, you know, get those numbers of microbes down um, as quickly as possible and to keep those numbers low while we wait around for all the other parts of the immune system to start to respond. Antimicrobial peptides is a huge group of proteins. So this is like a very short list of some of the antimicrobial peptides that are out there. Again, I'm only going to kind of hit some highlights. But what I want you to know is that there are tons of them. Um, also, what I want you to know is that um, innate immunity in general um, is sort of special because innate immunity is actually found in um, many, many organisms, not just the vertebrates I told you about. So if you if we were to think about like invertebrate immunology, like what kind of immune system does a mic does a mosquito have or something like that, antimicrobial peptides would be a huge part of what they have. So we actually have antimicrobial peptides in all sorts of organisms. I know people who are studying antimicrobial peptides for all kinds of like interesting microbiology applications from all sorts of crazy organisms. Um, so um, in some areas of immunology, like this is it. Um, so you can see there's this huge list of all of these proteins. Um, what I want you to notice about just the reason why I'm showing you the whole list is that they tend to have um, specific locations um, where they're found, although most of those are sort of barrier organs, and they work in a bunch of different kind of ways. Um, I'm going to largely tell you about um, some called the defensins and the one at the top called um, lysozyme because they're the sort of the most famous examples. But again, in general, they can um, act in so many different kind of ways. Um, so lysozyme is um, one of the most famous. Um, and lysozyme, you might notice from the name lysozyme that it, the end is like enzyme. Um, and lysozyme is an enzyme. It has an enzymatic activity. Um, and its enzymatic activity, first, people didn't know like the, all the details. They just thought, oh, my gosh, it lyses bacteria. What we now know is that um, bacteria have this special compound, peptidoglycan, in their cell walls. 
you're seeing two different types of bacterial cell walls at the top one from a type of bacteria called a gram positive, one from a type of bacteria called a gram negative. The reason why I'm showing you this and the thing that's important is you can notice that they both have this peptidoglycan, this blue and purple stuff. There's a different amounts of it and things, but they both have it. Your cells have no peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is only made by prokaryotic cells. Lysozyme, this enzyme, specifically cuts a chemical linkage in peptidoglycan. So basically, this enzyme can destroy cell walls um, of prokaryotic cells and doesn't, and doesn't harm your cells whatsoever because your cells don't have this compound to be um, uh, cleaved. So that's the other really nice thing about a lot of the, particularly innate immune um, proteins is that, or innate immune anything, is that it's really good at being specific for hurting foreign stuff and not your stuff. Um, if you today wanted to do an experiment on lysozyme and you wanted to collect some human lysozyme, there are two sources that are particularly good sources of human lysozyme, which are spit and tears. Um, so there's a ton of lysozyme in both spit and tears. Um, trying to uh, reduce numbers of microorganisms. Um, another big uh, group of antimicrobial peptides are um, a group of antimicrobial peptides known as defensins. Um, again, there are lots of subtypes of defensins. Um, what you can notice, um, I'm going to notice a couple things about the defensins. Um, they are generally made either by barrier organ cells or by innate immune cells like neutrophils. Um, you can see that they are generally defending barrier organs. Um, you'll, you will see intestinal epithelium a lot up here. Uh, we often think about defensins as being really important in the intestine. Um, here you're seeing um, sort of that same uh, small intestine wall with those nice extended um, projections. So you have lots of surface area for absorption. Um, and deep down in this little crypt area, you actually have cells that just make defensins to try to keep the microbe number lower in your GI tract. So we, so a lot of um, the defensins are actually made in your GI tract to keep numbers really low. Um, other thing that you can notice about this figure is that it tells you about um, the regulation of synthesis of all of these defensins. And what you notice in all of the places where it gives you info in this table, it includes the word constitutive. Um, sometimes it also lists other stuff, but it always says constitutive. So what's constitutive mean? One of those biology words that I don't know like exactly what class you encounter it in, so I figure I should define it now. <laughs> so constitutive means happens all the time automatically, doesn't need to be turned on. And so basically the idea is that these cell types are just making defensins automatically. They don't need to be told make defensins. They don't need a signal to make defensins. They just make them 24-7. And so we'll see some other things that we'll see later this semester where that are constitutive, which just means they're happening all the time and they do, like they don't need something to tell them you should happen now. Sometimes you can see we can also turn on extra defensins, but usually I want you to think about them as constitutive. And so I mention this because again, remember one of the key features of these um, antimicrobial peptides and really all of the proteins of the innate immune system is that you already have them, even before the microbe is there. You already have plenty in your GI tract right now. You made tons. So if you eat something sketchy, you already, the, the peptides are already sitting there. They didn't need to be triggered. They're ready to go to start defending you right now. Um, defensins, um, are, you can see that we have a very, very, um, detailed, uh, protein structure of a defensin right here. <laughs> Um, of this greenish circle. 
uh, was sort of greenish and yellowish. And the key thing about the d structure of that protein is that it has a charge. Um, and so it's a positively charged peptide. You can see it's positive charge. Um, and the way that defensins work is that defensins actually insert themselves into cell membranes and make pores in those cell membranes. And so you can see the defensins will come in and they will make a pore. And that will lyse the pathogen cell by lysing the membrane. Um, I remember learning this in my undergrad immunology class and being desperately confused. And the reason why I was desperately confused is because I said, my cells have a lipid bilayer. My cells have a cell membrane. How come the, all my defensins aren't killing all my cells? Why, why do the defensins kill just bacteria? And why don't they kill, why doesn't my entire intestine get killed by those defensins? It doesn't make any sense. I, I think I have a lipid bilayer. Um, the answer is actually over here. Um, it turns out that our cells, um, do a lot of work sorting phospholipids and charges. So we put different charges in different places in our cells. We put all of our negative charges inside the cell membrane for reasons. Bacteria don't do any sorting, so they have negative charges everywhere. They have negative charge phospholipids on both the outside and the inside of their membrane. As a result, a positively charged peptide easily has something to interact with on that bacterial membrane because um, all those negative charges are present on the outside. When in our cells, there are no negative charges present on the outside, so the peptide really doesn't um, interact with them in the same way. Yes? One of the, it, it actually is a couple reasons. Um, so it, the reason why bacteria don't is really because it's too energetic to do that. Um, we get some additional benefits from it. Um, so it's sort of a question of why do we do it or why do they not? Uh, but I would say, yes, they don't because it's too energetically uh, costly. Um, among some of the other really cool um, antimicrobial peptides um, are things like this one, um, alpha mic uh, macroglobulin. Um, I mention uh, alpha uh, 2 macroglobulin more to remind you of the sort of thinking about this infection, preventing infection, preventing disease, and when we kind of talked about like the trade-off stuff. Um, alpha 2, um, so a lot of microbes have um, proteases that cause a lot of the damage. So the microbe, if it just lived in your GI tract, the microbe itself is probably fine. The problem is the microbe makes a protease, and the protease messes you up. And so some of these antimicrobial peptides don't actually kill the microbe. They just do things like make sure the protease can't mess you up. So they don't do anything about the infection. They let the microbe stay. They just neutralize or they just act against the one little piece of it that causes you problems. Um, and, alpha, and this is how alpha-2 macroglobulin works. So you can see it basically has like a, a, a peptide structure that this protease wants to cleave. So the protease tries to cleave it. And alpha-2 microglobulin makes a conformational change and just holds on to the protease. And it's like, haha, you can't hurt me now. I'm, I'm sequestering you and wrapping you in my blanket. You can't hurt me. But it doesn't do a thing about the infection. So the infection, the, micro, the rest of the microbe just does its thing. We just get rid of the protease that is actually causing the disease. Um, and so, again, I mention this to point out that, you know, you know, in some cases it's really about just dealing with the part of the microbe that's causing disease, and we don't even have to necessarily stop infection. Because um, it might be too hard to stop the whole infection, but if you just stop this one protease, that's way easier, um, and something that's going to work more, uh, is more likely to work for you. All right. So, as I said, when I talk about um, antimicrobial peptides, or when I talk about proteins of the innate immune system, they're kind of two sides or two bits of it that I think about. One of them is this broad area of antimicrobial peptides. 
other is this broad area called complement. If you had asked um, grad student me about complement, or in fact, if you would talk to me kind of when I started my teaching career about how do you feel about talking about complement, you would not have gotten a very positive answer. Um, especially when I was in grad school, we were like, oh my gosh, compliment. I would rather watch paint dry than talk about compliment. Um, and part of the reason is because these proteins are proteins that are found in the blood. They were discovered a really long time ago. Um, that it feels like you're reading a very dusty textbook when you're thinking about compliment. Um, but in more recent years, we have been learning a lot more about compliment and places where Complements really important that we never would have thought of before, and complements kind of becoming new and more interesting. Um, this is actually an eyeball, um, and all of these little patches that are actually obscuring this person's vision are patches of complement. Um, and sometimes when you see little floaties in your eye when you, they're closed, though, that's actually complement fragments that your eye is trying to clear out. Um, we have started to realize that there are some big issues with complement in um, some neurologic diseases, but the place where it's actually been shown to be the most important more recently is in arthritis. Complement is a huge uh, contributor to arthritis. But there are all of these diseases like macular degeneration that people were like, no, that's definitely not an immune system problem. That's something else. And every time we have, or often when there, when there are these diseases, we find out, oh, wait, but they have complement in them. Hmm. Um, so complement, um, while it has some things that, you know, are not my favorite to talk about, are not everyone's favorite thing to study, is actually pretty uh, important. Um, so if, again, um, I can also tell you um, when I started grad school, one of my really close friends from college um, went to med school. And she called me pretty early in her med school immunology class. And she said, and it was like the first day or so. She's like, you're kidding me. You are in graduate school for immunology. You like want to study this complementary stuff for the rest of your life. She's like, this isn't, that was the most boring thing I've ever learned about in my entire life. And you want to do that for your whole, like what's wrong with you? And I was like, that's not all of immunology at all. Don't worry. But um, so know that, like, again, it's not the, the winner and the favorite. It's not. But I'm also going to try to give you a, a good overview to help you understand how to understand it. Um, and this is one where some people get freaked out when they see the compliment stuff and they're like, oh, my gosh, I don't know ever how I'm going to, like, know this for exams or study it. Um, make, I will show you old exams. I'll show you some old problems and show you how I ask questions about it, because it's not like. I'm going to be drawing stuff on the board today and um, Wednesday. I'm never going to be like, recreate that entire drawing. Like, I'm going to ask you important questions about important steps. So when I'm doing the drawing, don't get like, ah, about it. <laughs> um, but the first big thing you've got to know about complement is basically the, the key important thing that's happening in every step. And that's what's being shown here. In complement, there's some protein, like this protein C3, um, that's shown here. Many of the complement proteins have a name that's like C in some number, or complement. And something happens to that protein so that it gets cut by a protease, here, helpfully shown by scissors. When that protein gets cut, Unsurprisingly, it gets made into two fragments. You can see the two fragments here. One's bigger, one's smaller. And one of those fragments is going to get attached to things, usually attached to the microbe. So I'm going to talk about, well, we're going to get to this protein is going to happen. Oh my gosh, it gets cleaved. Oh my gosh, one of the parts gets stuck. And then this protein gets cleaved. And oh my gosh, one of the parts gets, gets cut. And one of the parts gets stuck. And on and on and on. It's really like literally every, I'm going to introduce you to a protein. And I'll be like, what do you think happens? And the answer is always, it gets cut. And one part goes away and one part gets stuck. Um, 
oftentimes when because this was described a really long time ago, the idea of the complement protein getting attached or getting stuck to the microbe was referred to as complement fixation. I don't know why they decided to call it complement fixation. So if I ever say complement fixation, I mean complement getting attached to stuff. I mean complement happening. Um, also, sometimes immunologists um, will abbreviate complement as C prime. Um, so if you happen to notice that in a paper ever, where they're like, oh, and we added C prime, they mean complement. All right. Here's everyone's, here's one of the unfavorite slides. So this is your textbook's view of complement. Um, and I want to sort of give you an overview of what the heck we're caring about. I will also tell you there are a lot of ways, if any of you guys have learned in like an A&P class about blood clotting and sort of a blood clotting cascade, there are a lot of ways that complement is actually like has a lot of similarities and is really, has a, is very similar to a blood clotting cascade in a bunch of ways. But the basic idea of complement is that we hope we can find chalk. Um, and then we have three different ways complement can get started. So you can see my three ways complement gets started. All of those three ways that complement gets started, sometimes they're known as the initiation pathways. Um, all of them kind of end up at the same couple of steps. So you can, so the idea is you got three ways to get to here. So this box in the middle. Once you get to that box in the middle, you're going to get rid of the microbe. And there are they're calling it three ways. I'm going to call it four ways, but I'm only going to tell you like a sentence about one of them. <laughs> um, there are a few different ways that you can get rid of the microbe. And immunologists love this word, which is these are usually known as the effector phase. We love the word effector. I didn't even think, realize it for a while until one of my non-immunologist friends is like, can you define that word? And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean everyone doesn't know that? Effector means how you get rid of a microbe. Effector is how you have an effect, how you do the thing. Um, so we've kind of got this initiation stage. There's three different choices depending on the circumstances. Then you get to this common middle stage. And then you can have four different ways to get rid of the microbe, four different effector phases. And these can actually, you can usually have multiple of these at once happening. So like you can have multiple things happening. You could do like this left initiation phase and then the left effector phase or left initiation phase and this sort of can go in either different way. And so what I want you to largely be thinking about is, um, what are the sort of, in, we're going to think about what are the initiation phases, like what are the key steps and like why might they happen? We're going to talk a little bit about what's in the box. And then we're going to talk about the ways you actually get rid of the microbes. Um, and so like when I've asked questions about this, you know, before I've asked like, what are pros and cons of this or that initiation part? I'm not asking you to like describe the whole initiation part. I'm just like saying, why is this one good or bad? Or I might say, you have a mouse that is missing this protein. What part of complement can it not do? And so all I want you to say is like, oh yeah, that protein was like up here, or that protein was down here. So I know which part it can't do. Um, so that's the kind of things I'm doing. I'm not gonna ever ask you to draw out this whole business. Um, so this is your, the way that your uh, textbook describes this. Um, and this is, I mean, I'll show you in a second, the view from another textbook as well. One of the, the way that I like to talk about uh, complement is I like to start with one of the initiation phases known as the classical pathway. The classical pathway was named the classical pathway because it was like the first one we ever learned about. 
Um, and to me, the classical pathway is the easiest one to learn first. You'll see why. Um, one thing to note about the classical pathway um, is that the classical pathway is actually probably the third of these two have evolved. So it's probably the most recent, the newest one. Um, only some organisms have a classical pathway. Pretty much everybody's got some of the other pathways. Um, but I find them harder to, like, they're easier to explain if you can compare them to classical, is what I like to do. So I'm going to start with the classical pathway. I'm going to get us to this middle box and tell you what happens in the middle box. And then I'm going to tell you the effector pathways. Then we go back up to the top and we see the other two initiation pathways. Because we, we do a few steps and then we get to the box. And then when we get to the box, I'm like, it's the same as before. And then we go to the top and we get to the box and we're like, it's the same as before. So that's kind of how we're going to do this. Um, your textbook shows this to you in words like this. Um, another textbook that um, immunologists often use um, shows it here in pictures. Um, and so we're going to be walking through the steps of this in pictures. Um, so, like I said, we're going to start with uh, initiating by the classical pathway. The classical pathway starts, the very first step of the classical pathway is that an antibody binds to the surface of pathogen. Um, you can see an uh, antibody shown here. And all you need to know about an antibody right now is that an antibody has a Y shape. And so you can see sort of the short, one of the short arms of the Y is binding to the microbe. The tail part of the Y is sticking out. Um, and so that's the first step for um, the classical pathway. Um, this is sort of, uh, there are a couple things that are important when thinking about this. Um, one of them is that the geometry ends up being kind of important here in terms of where those little tails are. You don't really care about that now, but later you will care. <laughs> later in the semester, suddenly that will matter. Now it doesn't matter, but the geometry does matter here. But there's one other thing about this that's like asterisk, an important asterisk to know about the classical pathway. This is like a key thing to know about the classical pathway. Hint, hint. Starts with an antibody. Antibodies are part of the adaptive immune system, not the innate immune system. Antibodies are actually a product made by the adaptive immune system. So the classical pathway actually starts with something that comes from the adaptive immune system. The rest of it's all innate, but it starts with something that's adaptive. So this is another place where sort of innate and adaptive are kind of overlapping a little bit. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is why actually all organisms can't do classical pathway, because all organisms don't have adaptive immunity. Um, and so that's kind of one key thing to think about with the classical pathway. So once our antibody has bound to the surface of the pathogen, it gets bound by the first complement protein. If you were in charge of the world, based on what I have told you thus far, what would you name the first complement protein? Yes, David. C1. You might name it C1, because I told you it was often C and then something. The first complement protein is named C1. <laughs> so C1, you can see here, um, this is a, sort of a cartoon version that they show in your textbook. Um, yes, it has subparts that I am not dealing with right now. Um, this is actually a version of it under a microscope. And so you can see it really does look like this. Um, and people often describe C1 as looking like an upside down bouquet of flowers. <laughs> is often how people describe it. And you can see it legit looks like that. 
in reality. C1 binds to that antibody that's on the surface of the pathogen. So we had our antibody bound. Remember we had those like tails that were off fluttering in the air. C1 comes and binds to them. And so here you can see C1 binding. When C1 um, binds to antibody, it becomes, one of its parts becomes, which again, not going into that level of detail, part of it becomes a protease. So it suddenly gains protease activity. What does it mean that it gains protease activity? Yeah. So now it has the ability to cleave something else. And remember, I told you that in complement, a lot of this is just stuff gets cleaved and then stuff gets cleaved and then stuff gets cleaved. So now this can cleave something. <laughs> Brooke, what's your question? Um, so how long does this take to work since it starts with the bacteria? So the, the, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, that was like, it's a yeah. great question. It's, it's quick the second time you have an, you see the microbe. Okay. Cause you made, you had to make the antibody the first time. It's quick the second time. The other ones, since you don't need an antibody, are quick the first time. This one's only quick. Great question. So now C1 is an active protease. And C1 is going to cleave the next member of this pathway. This will be the hardest one for you to remember. And the reason why it's the hardest one to remember is because it makes you learn that immunologists don't know how to count. Because in a perfect world, it would be C2 but it's not. In fact, it is C4. So you can see C4 gets cleaved and gets stuck on to microbe. When that happens, C4 becomes an active protease. And it cleaves the next thing in the process. Guess what's the next thing in the process? C2. Now, now we learn how to count. I know. Th that, is, that is the hardest part of the classical pathway, is remembering that four comes before two. Um, so you can see that basically we're going to have C4 and C2 attached to the surface of the cell. And you can kind of see that here as well. When C4, uh, the, a portion of C4 and a portion of C2 are attached to the surface of the cell, they act as a protease. Sometimes because complement was uh, described a billion years ago, they use weird old fashioned terms. So sometimes instead of saying protease, they say convertase. So they make a convertase. And officially, the thing that they convert is C3. The, another way of saying that is that they're a protease that cuts C3. So now you can see C4 and C2 together cut up C3. So you can see we went one, four, two, three. <laughs> As you can see here, when C3 gets cleaved, it gets cleaved into two pieces. That was true of all the other ones too, but we actually don't care about both pieces there, so I ignored it. The C3, we do care about both pieces. So we have this little tiny one called C3A. It floats away. We'll see it later. And we have one that gets attached to the surface, C3B. Now that we're at C3, and we have C3B here, C3 is going to, particularly C3B, is going to be able to act as a protease. Guess what C3 cleaves? 
Hmm? No, we already did C2. C5. C5. Correct. Yeah, so the only problem with classical is a four is in the wrong place. Otherwise, it's just the numbers. The activation of C3 to make C3A and C3B, and that's the ability of that to make C5, which becomes, get ready, C5A and C5B, a small piece and a big piece. That's the middle that all of the pathways have to get to. So once we've gotten to C3 and C5, we're done with the top. And when we're thinking about the other initiation pathways, all we have to do for them is get to C3 and C5. Once we've, once we have, once C5 is done, we destroy the pathogen. And so basically what we've just done is we've gone through the classical pathway. You can see that your book tells you how we got to C3. Now C3, um, and uh, is on the pathogen surface along with C5. That's our middle piece. And then we can, from C5 on, destroy the pathogen in a few different ways. And on Wednesday next week, I will start telling you about the different ways we can destroy the pathogen um, and we, the other ways to get to, um, the other ways to initiate. Um, what you'll notice is that some of the names of the proteins like sound slightly different in some of the other parts. So remember how I said I might ask you, like, if you um, have a mouse that's deficient in something, what can it not do? If it has C in a number like C2 or C4, that could give a thing in your head that says ding, 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 classical. <laughs> that's pretty much what you need there. <laughs> so again, don't feel like this is like crazy, because like, this is going to keep, we're going to fill in more stuff. Um, it's don't, I don't want you to be intimidated by it because people sometimes get intimidated and it's really not that bad. I have finally taught myself. Um, so I will see you guys on, uh, Wednesday. Know that the homework for, um, two weeks from now is already posted if you are looking for stuff going on and I will finish updating Moodle over the weekend. Uh, so I'll see you Wednesday.